Um, I'm going to talk to you uh, about something that is, you know, I personally am very excited about, and um, I'm, I'm just excited to be able to kind of share maybe a little bit of that excitement with you guys. And if you walk out of this uh, presentation uh, with just a little spark of enthusiasm that I have for this particular topic, then uh, then I am a happy uh, happy person. So. Um, <coughs> Let's turn this the other way around, so then it goes forward instead of backwards. That's useful. Um, it's, it's not about drones, right? Although I do like drones. You know, it's very cool. Um, you know, my kids like drones, and I live in Amsterdam, so the idea of having your cannabis delivered by drone seems like a pretty, 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 cool, uh, pretty cool idea. Certainly uh, would get rid of some of the traffic, at least. Um, it's also not about self-driving cars, although I'm even more excited about that, right? This is uh, uh, LeBron James. He's a, he's a basketball player, apparently. Any Americans here will clearly know him, or anybody who's interested in, in that particular sport would know him. Um, but he's advertising here. You know, He's advertising uh, self-driving cars. Uh, he's also doing a very good job at making a very large car look extremely small. So I'm not sure what brand this is, but I'm sure they're not particularly happy. They should have just taken a, a small... Uh, uh, a jockey or somebody to do that. Um, also interesting, Amazon Go, right? We've, we've probably all seen it in the news recently. Uh, no more queues, right? No more queues. We're going to check out without any queues. Although, you know, if you kind of think of a bottleneck theory, because we're all supply chain experts here, right? It seems, if you look at this picture, that uh, the bottleneck has kind of moved forward a little bit. So everybody seems to be queuing up to get into the shop instead of getting queued in to get out of the shop. A little bit lightheartedness, of course, and you know it's a it's a, it's a great it's a great uh, move forward. But it's not what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, um, I'm I'm going to use a little video to uh, to try and get you uh, to uh, to understand what I do want to talk about. And uh, this is Duncan Engolf, the president of Info, telling you a little bit about uh, the topic that I'm going to be talking about. started with a single gust of steam. We grew, expanded, connected, took giant leaps forward. We developed better communication, new ideas, innovation blossomed, genius boomed. We kept inventing, experimenting, getting bolder, more creative. Humanity roared. We pushed ourselves and our inventions. Our machines got faster and faster, while our systems got smaller and smaller. Before long, we developed a railway for data. Now, all of the information in all of the libraries in the world is at our fingertips. And every day, the human experience becomes more and more of a shared experience. We are digital. Every action is a number. That information, that data, is stored, tracked, and analyzed, giving us new insights into our world, our industries. The connections are endless. Our collective brain power keeps growing, multiplying. The power of our innovations has given birth to a new kind of intelligence. Smarter machines, coupled with the vast amounts of data at our disposal, means better insights, more forward motion, faster. Automation gives us wings, empowers us to focus on the most complex aspects of running our business. We are now on the verge of another paradigm shift, another boom that will change everything. The possibilities are boundless. Welcome to the age of networked intelligence. You're feeling it. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Duncan Angove and uh, the wonderful Hollywood uh, production team there behind this. Um, of course, what I'm going to talk about is supply chain management, right? Because that's all what we're here for. But I'm going to talk about it from a network supply chain management perspective. 
that's the, uh, that's the kind of the key thing that I want to talk about for the rest, uh, rest of this, uh, whatever is remaining 40 minutes or so <clears throat> of our time. I've split this presentation up into four sections. So I'll do a, a little bit around, you know, why the trends and the challenges and you know, why supply chain component. And, you know, to a large degree, of course, you know, this is me preaching to the, to the choir, of course, because you guys are living all that stuff every minute of every day. So it's easy for me as a consultant to kind of listen to you guys and think, ooh, ooh, that's tough. Ooh, that's tough. Let me write it down and, and I'll present it back to you. The second portion I'm going to talk to you about, why network? What's so special about network? Everybody talks about networks, right? So let me, let me explain that component. Then I'm going to talk about a couple of organizations that have kind of made that leap into network supply chain management and uh, give you a couple of those case studies. And then the, the, the last component, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on kind of the digital frontier, if you like. You know, what's, where, where, is the, where are things going uh, after, uh, after today? <clears throat> um, some of the trends that we can that we can see today is uh, you know everybody's everybody's living in a in a connected world right the days of the integrated Henry Ford manufacturing days of the 1920s they are long long gone of course and that's nothing new to you your supply chains in general are big complex got lots of parties and lots of information is outside of the four walls of your own organization and that of course brings a lot of complexity with it. We've got hyper-personalization or mass customization, both you know, from, from a retail perspective, but also from a manufacturing perspective. You know, there's a huge skew proliferation, which is making pretty much everybody's life a little bit more difficult. Um, we've got disruptive competition, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute, because it's not just about the competition kind of in your beautifully defined segment, it's often also people coming in from left, right, and center from areas that we hadn't expected, you know, 10, five, or even two years ago. Um, and, and lastly, we, we, we have the always on commerce, right? Especially you know, for the retailers uh, amongst us, you know, you don't sleep, you know, I, I, I feel for you, right? There's, there's stuff happening all the time, orders coming in every moment in time. And although we kind of done the front end side of that, we've, 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 we've given it a lot of attention. But the fulfillment side of, of the omni-channel challenge, it's a challenge by itself to say that, um, is, 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 a difficult, is a difficult one to, to fix. But also on, on the manufacturing side, if you put a little bit of a slant on that, you know, what, what I've seen in, in, a, in a lot of manufacturing companies is actually where they're moving from, from products to services. Right? I'm working with one particular company, a, a, a mining company. They make the, the drill hats for, for drilling tunnels and drilling, uh, drilling in mines. And, uh, everybody's nightmare, a Windows update in the middle of your uh, presentation. Um, <clears throat> the, the, at the moment, and, and, and until relatively recently, they were a, a product company, right? And if you have a drill head, you know, you, once the drill head's there, you drill and it's great. If the drill head stops or it breaks, then, you know, they cost a lot of money. But the drill head's really expensive as well. So what do I do? Do I have vast amounts of inventory and kind of just, you know, have that sitting there? Well, the, the financial guys typically don't really like that. So what they're doing is now completely digitalizing that. So they're putting sensors on the heads of the, uh, of the drill heads so they can monitor the wear and tear of the, uh, of the drill heads. And they know exactly when it's time to go and ship spare parts or new drill heads to that particular location. So they're taking a whole different approach. They've taken that services approach. So I think that trend is very much in the, uh, in the manufacturing world is happening as well. And as you will notice, I will kind of try and use a little bit of retail uh, examples and manufacturing examples as we go through, through this, uh, this presentation. Now, all these trends are happening and probably many, many more. <clears throat> and we are being told by our management that we need to be more agile. You know, we need to you know, increase our velocity. Uh, uh, we need to be more in innovative. Oh, and by the way, if you could just grow the bottom line, you know, grow our revenue and increase our, uh, our profit margins, that would be really nice. So... You know, you guys live this every day of the every day of the world. So, I'm quite happy to uh, to be a, to be a consultant and not have to uh, have to do that every day. Uh, my head goes off to you guys. Um, a little bit more about uh, um, disruptions, and uh, you know, we we kind of know the, the competitive uh, side of it, right? So, we all know that Amazon has taken over the world. You know, nothing but. Uh, world domination seems to be the, the, the credo of, uh, of, of Amazon. Um, and, and we know that Air, Airbnb and Uber are doing, doing you know, some, some significant things in their particular, uh, particular industries. And I personally, I'm, I'm a great fan of Tesla. I mean, who, who would have known like 10 years ago that an, a company out of Silicon Valley would be challenging the likes of BMW and Mercedes 
for, for the, the high-end uh, high vehicles. I mean, the last organization that had a go at that would be, I guess, would be Lexus, I guess, that had a, had a good go at that. And, you know, they weren't a little startup, right? They were, at the time, part of the largest car manufacturer in the world. And here you've got a technology startup that is kind of doing that. That's pretty transformational. I, I love it. You also have disruptions, of course, that have got nothing to do with competitions or, or, or others. Um, you know, black swan events. Uh, here's an example of, of Apple uh, having to shut down one of its factories because one of the, the supplier has gone, uh, gone out of business. You know, bad, bad for business, clearly. Uh, or, and I think everybody will remember this one, it's not that long ago <laughs> that we had the, the ransomware attacks and uh, where very unfortunately the Damco and, 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 and Maersk combination had a, uh, had a significant challenge there to, uh, to kind of contain the, uh, the, the outfall of uh, the fallout of, uh, of, of their ransomware challenge. And it's nice, right? I mean, I've got nice pictures of these kind of things, but 99.9% .9 of all the disruptions that we deal with on a daily basis don't actually, actually make the news, right? I can't create a little cutout for that. 99% of, of our challenges that we live with are things like, oh, the supplier is just two days later with a shipment, or, um, you know, a, a shipment, uh, a, sorry, a supplier is late with producing their goods, or a shipment is a little bit late, or, you know, we've had to write off some inventory. You know, it's the smaller things that are constantly happening that are also disrupting our supply chain. And arguably, those are way more difficult to deal with than the big ones where everybody gets the attention to try and fix it. We kind of take a little bit of a, a retail angle here. <clears throat> The retail apocalypse is upon us. Um, yeah, I guess it's been like that for, for quite some time. This is a picture that shows you the, the foreclosures, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, the shops that are uh, the, at the rate of, of closure from, from Bloomberg. And um, although this is, uh, you know, this is very US-centric, uh, US it kind of shows an interesting trend, right? I mean, just, just last year, there were more, there, were, there was the highest level of, of closures of, uh, of uh, of uh, retail outlets. So it's not letting up, right? It's, it's continuously going on. Now, you might think, well, you know, this is the US, and that's, that's true. Uh, you know, the US, you know, if the US has five times more uh, foot, foot space or, or square footage um, than, uh, than the UK from a, from a retail outlet perspective. And it's got 10 times more than, uh, than uh, what Germany has. So clearly they've, they've gone a little bit overboard in the last uh, 50 years in building their malls and whatever you. Um, but it's not just the US, of course, right? You just have to open the newspapers. Um, I guess I should say click on the, on the link to open your, uh, your news feed, and you see things like this. You know, Marks and Spencer's having a mixed Christmas. Now, my memory's not fantastic, but I think the headline last year was pretty similar, and the year before was pretty similar as well, right? They're, they're struggling. All these guys, the, the bricks and mortar guys, are struggling. Why? Because it's the guys like ASOS, you know, the largest pure online retailer from, a, from an apparel, footwear and apparel perspective, um, that, are, uh, that are growing like, uh, like wildfire. They are, uh, they've done 1.75 million, uh, sorry, 1.75 billion this last year, and they're hoping to hit 2.5 billion in 2019. Those are big numbers, right? Those are big numbers in, in the retail world, especially when you realize kind of the, the Marks and Spencers of this world, they're completely flat. But you know, if we think that this is eye-dropping growth, you know, behind that you've got guys like this. This is a Manchester company called Boohoo. They, they seem to every time I blink my eyes, they seem to have doubled their revenue. I mean, it's it's absolutely crazy. You know, they're now a quarter of a billion turnover. This company, and until a couple of months ago, I'd, I'd never even heard of them. And uh, you know, their target is to be a billion turnover company in the next five years. Well, at the rate they're going, I have no doubt that they will absolutely uh, absolutely make that. Let's talk a little bit about kind of the manufacturing slant again. This is a study by PwC on the Industry 4.0, and uh, it was all about kind of figuring out, you know, what does it actually entail? Because everybody talks about Industry 4.0, but, but you know, what does it really mean for, uh, for people? And kind of this is what they came out with. And what I, of course, as a supply chain practitioner, am pleased to see is what the, you know, what's sapping in the center here is digital supply chain. So. It's the supply chain that is extremely important. It's not just about engineering and manufacturing. It's not just about uh, pre preventative maintenance. It is also about true supply chain. It's also about integrating planning and execution, logistics visibility, um, and all the, all the kind of components that, uh, that go with that. 
So I think we can kind of safely say that you know, supply chain should be your competitive advantage or is your competitive advantage, depending on kind of where you're at at this, uh, this particular, uh, particular stage. Um, and if you do harness that, so what are, the, what are the kind of the benefits that we could expect to see? Well, if you, uh, if you believe um, Boston uh, Consulting Group, and uh, they kind of know one or two things about supply chain management, um, there's some significant benefits to be had, right? If we look at the numbers here of increase in product, product availability of 10%, you know, increase, uh, increase operating margins up to like 110%, fewer, fewer cash conversion days by up to 64%. These are nice numbers, right? If you could bring those numbers to your boss, you know, there'd be a little pay rise in it uh, for sure, right? These are, these are nice numbers. But that's enough of kind of the introduction, because so far you probably think like, yep, okay, that's, that's true. Yep, you've just described the world that I live in every, every day. Um, what I want to do now is kind of talk to you a little bit about networks. Why supply chain networks? I'm not, um, and then I want to talk a little bit about some case studies and a little bit about innovation. Um, the answer to um, why networks is very, very simple. It really evolves around one number, and the number is 80. It's 80%. 80% of the data of your supply chain, on average, sits outside of the four walls of your own organization. Right? Think about all the purchase orders you place. Think about all the shipments that are coming inbound and going outbound. Think about inventory, inventory moves that are not within your own organization but actually held at third party locations. 80% of the data that you need to run your supply chain is outside the four walls. Yet from an IT perspective, from an information technology perspective, mostly we've been focusing the last 30 years on ERPs, planning tools, whereas management tools, they're all focusing on the things that are inside the four walls of your organization. And that thing that is outside of it, it's like that's a kind of a secondary thing. Um, it doesn't work. That only covers you for, for 20%. Why? Well, you know, it goes back again to the to Henry Ford example, right? This is what supply chains look like. They're vastly extended. We've got partners everywhere. We've got suppliers in many, many different continents. We've got customers in different continents. We've got everybody who's part of suppliers, brokers, shippers, carriers, 3PLs, financial institutions, all there to fulfill the promises that you've made to your customers. And how do people connect today? How do, how do people exchange information today? Because it's, this is nothing new, of course, right? You know, we've had suppliers for, for, a, for a long, long time. Um, but for a long, long time, it's been phone, fax. I'm not really sure how you do a fax, but, you know, fax. Um, it's EDI connections if, you, if, you're, if you're lucky. And that's how we've been exchanging. But there's a bit of a problem with that, right? The one obvious problem is the fact that there is never one single version of the truth, right? Because if I send you a fax with some information, and we're in sync for now, but you know what, you're my supplier and you're my 3PL, you actually need to move the stuff that you have manufactured to me. Well, if I don't synchronize between you three, then we're not in sync, right? we don't know what we're doing. So we can keep on trying to send emails and spreadsheets and do you know, uh, blind copies and, and uh, carbon copies and what have you on our emails, but ultimately that's just gonna fall down. So the way to do this is to completely invert the information model. Instead of us all looking at ourselves being the center of the universe, let's put the information in the center. Right? Let us put the order, purchase order in the middle so that you can see it and you can see it in real time and we can all collaborate on this at the same time. That'd be pretty cool, right? And this is nothing new, right? Just think about it, right? Instead of, instead of us sending information, we're posting information. Now, where do we do this today? And most of us do this every day. It's Facebook, LinkedIn. It's the same model, right? You know, even your grandma knows that you're not sending something on Facebook, right? You're posting something on Facebook. And what do you do? You have one single object, and maybe that object is a picture of the grandchildren or your children or yourself doing something wacky. Uh, wacky. Um, but it's still some single object that everybody can see, and then we, we count the number of likes that we have. Now apply that into supply chain management, and by the way, supply chain management, of course, is a hundred times more complicated than counting the number of likes on your Facebook. But the same principle applies. 
as in 4G to Nexus, we've been doing that for quite some time. We've actually been doing that for, uh, for 17 years. So we have a platform that does exactly that. And we're managing about half a trillion worth of goods on that platform on a daily basis. We have about 40 billion worth of goods being, uh, being paid and financed on that platform. Because guess what? For every physical flow of goods, there is a financial counterflow. So why on earth would they not be linked? Because they are linked in real life, right? You don't pay anybody unless they ship something or unless they make something for you. That's when you ship it, that's when you pay it. So those two processes and all the related processes are very much interlinked. Um, I won't go through all these numbers here, they, they, they speak, for the, speak for themselves. And you know, if you, if you kind of start then trying to visualize what all that looks like, you, know, you get something like this, right? Lots and lots of companies all operating in an inter international environment and creating pictures that look, uh, look pretty and have got lots of colors on there. I'll go back to kind of, kind of the, uh, the, uh, the IT side of that in a little bit. So who are the companies that have, uh, that have kind, of, kind of joined? Well, there's, there's quite a few of them. Uh, and I clearly won't touch all of them, but the key message is here, and I've grouped them neatly into kind of different, different segments. The message is that we don't just do this. There's not just one single industry that can benefit from that. You know? If you look at what all these companies have in common, they typically are relatively, relatively large organizations, uh, but mostly they're internationally operating, right? They have extended supply chains. For these companies, that 80% rule really applies. That's one of the reasons why they, why they, why they join a network in the first place. You know, if you look at um, somebody like, uh, like Columbia, for example, you know, they all have their own stories. You know, Columbia, the guys who make the, the outer, 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 the sports uh, gear for climbing and, and, and what have you, um, they joined because they were fed up with letter of credits. Right? This is going back more than 10 years ago already. But they were fed up with letter of credits, and letter of credits are very expensive, right? To, uh, to do, uh, to, 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 to manage and to, to, uh, uh, to manage your trade with. So that was the reason for them to say, hey, we need to be able to join a collaborative networked supply chain approach. Um, other people um, say, say uh, uh, C and H. So this is uh, the uh, Fiat Industrial Group. You know, they're manufacturers. They're heavy manufacturers to make trucks and things like that uh, and tractors. So for them, it's all about the efficiency of the plant. Now, what stops the efficiency of a plant? There not being any parts to be able to assemble things. So their focus wasn't lateral credits and things like that. No, their focus, their starting point was, I just need to know where my stuff is. I need to make sure that the stuff that is coming from my suppliers, the axles and the bits and the pieces, that they all arrive just in time so that I can assemble them. And that's wonderful if you have them all, you know, if you source around the clock tower, if you're right, if, the, if you have that model, then that's a little bit easier. But in their instance, they don't. Their suppliers are global. They're all over the show. So for them, that was their starting point. I just need to, need, need to see where is my stuff. And I need to have the confidence that it's going to arrive. And if not, I need to be, uh, I, um, I need to be told about it as early as possible so I can do something about it. And so each and every one of these little colorful logos has his own story. Um, and I'm going to just touch upon a couple and, and dive a little, bit, uh, a little bit deeper into them. Um, I won't do all of them, but uh, uh, I guess I'll start with Columbia because I just started, uh, started talking about them. So letter of credits was the first thing that they started off with. But very quickly, and this is about, well, that is actually about 10 years ago now. Letter of credits was, was, a, was even before that. They work in, they're a brand, right? So they're the brand owner, but they don't manufacture anything. You know, everything is manufactured by suppliers. They're mostly in Asia, in the Indian subcontinent, uh, and they ship those things over to Europe and to wherever they might be. Until about 10 years ago, all that they manufactured and shipped, they shipped to central DC in Portland and then shipped it outbound again. And you know, you know, that's when the omni-channel thing already started to happen. So you know, they, don't, they don't sell purely through their own shop. They have lots of consignment stock in, in many different places, and uh, they have lots and lots of outlets. Now, what's the more efficient way to get your stuff there? It's probably to go direct, you know, ship them directly. But that's not that easy, right? If you, all your processes are geared towards receiving physically the stuff, opening the boxes, being able to see in there, yes, they're there, and I, I can check them, and I do my quality inspection, all that good stuff, and I then repackage it again, having the right labels on the box, because now it goes to Nordstrom, in, uh, and they need to have their own labels. That process is how it used to work. 
They didn't want that. They wanted to start direct shipping. Well, that means that all those processes now have to be done by your supplier in Asia and your 3PLs and all the parties that are happening. That means that it's thousands and thousands of miles away from your physical, physical eyesight. You know, 40% of the stuff that Colombia ships today, no Colombia employee ever sees it or touches it. It goes directly. Well, you need, some mechanism, you need some mechanisms in place to manage those processes. And a network supply chain approach is exactly that. Um, let, let's go to the, to the right for you. Uh, Caterpillar, great story there. Uh, again, about 10 years ago, the CEO of Caterpillar got a call from one of its, uh, one of its dealers. Because Caterpillar is the guys who make the big dumb trucks, right? The, they're just the most enormous uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, at least that's what they're famous for, of course. Uh, and they sell through dealer networks all around the globe. And this uh, dealer rang, uh, rang the CEO up and said, like, mate, I can, I can order a book from Amazon, and I know exactly when it's going to arrive. Yet, I'm going to order a dump truck from you that I can practically see from out of space, and you can't tell me where it is and when I'm going to get it? Come on, that's not on. So they kind of just took this to heart and said, like, yeah, okay, that's, uh, you know, kind of need to do something about that. So again, that's kind of, that was the trigger point for them to say, yeah, we need to, we need to figure out what we're going to do here. Hey, we need to fix this visibility problem. So again, networked approach was the right way for them to go. And, and it didn't just stop there. I mean, whilst they, whilst they were doing that, they were tr creating that visibility, then they started doing this for the inbound side as well. Because on the inbound side, they also own all that inventory. So all of a sudden, they realized, like, hey, if I can take lots of variability out of that inbound, I need to keep less safety stock, and I own that safety stock. They took out a quarter of a billion worth of inventory just by doing that. And they could only do that because they joined a network. They joined a platform. And of course, the number here, the velocity. Um, if you go to Peoria, where the, where the head offices are, they have a, have a little counter when you, when you come in. And it has the speed of their supply chain in miles per hour. And, uh, that, uh, that used to go extremely slow, still doesn't go super, super fast, it's not at hundreds of miles an hour, right? But it is five times faster now than it used to be. That's a huge, huge accomplishment, of course. And that's to some degree a byproduct of a dealer ringing up saying, where's my stuff? And somebody triggering the idea of like, yeah, I need to do something different. I need to transform my business. And then they utilize all of that to kind of benefit their own organization with, with real hard cash, with measurable cash. Um, uh, Electrolux, another interesting, interesting example and a long-standing customer of ours. Uh, a couple of, couple, of, couple of years back, they, uh, there was a co collision between two, two ocean vessels just outside of uh, Singapore, and one of them uh, caught fire. And according to the, uh, to the, uh, to the carrier, uh, Electrolux had uh, 17 containers on board. Now, Electrolux knew immediately, it's like, uh-uh, that ain't right. You know, we can see exactly what we've got where. So they knew that they had 50% of their Christmas sale, or the, the goods that were for Christmas sale in Brazil, was on board that single vessel. Now, luckily, they knew immediately instead of afterwards, because afterwards, what happened was only a couple of containers were, 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 were caught fire. Then a little bit later, it turned out like, well, there's some damages to some of the other ones. And it turned out that pr pretty much all the containers on that vessel had smoke damage of some sort. So the stuff that was on that vessel, you know, it took months to get all that stuff off and, and, and uh, do something with that. Well, Electrolux literally knew immediately what was going on, so they immediately could take action. And Bjorn van Jensen, who's the VP of logistics uh, uh, for Electrolux, stated himself public that they saved 80 million because they knew immediately what the impact was, so they could take action on that. That was a nice numbers, right? Big numbers, just one event. Um, let's take another retail example here, Nike, Converse part of Nike. Um, they, they wanted to change their accounts payable process. So what they, do, what they do today is they have all the suppliers generating invoices on the platform. Now, by having them generate them on the platform, the matching process becomes very, very straightforward. It kind of doesn't exist anymore because they completely control what the supplier can create from an invoice perspective. That invoice is, is linked to the pack list that has been created on the platform. So that means with a couple of rules, they can automate the whole accounts payable 
um, uh, uh, invoice approval process. So 98% of all the invoices that Nike gets from its suppliers are automatically approved instantly. You know, the 2% are those outliers that came, went through the workflow and popped out to say, like, you know, somebody still needs to look at this and, and approve that. Now, what does that do? That all of a sudden means that a supplier has an approved invoice instantly, the moment, or, you know, hours after they have generated that invoice. Now, why does a supplier care about that? Well, an approved invoice is an asset. It's an asset that I can go to the bank with and say, hey, Mr. Bank, look, Nike is going to pay me $10,000 in, uh, in 60 days' time or 120 days' time. You know, can, you, can you give me some money against this, uh, this particular invoice? And the bank will say, sure. And you don't even have to go to the bank to do that. Of course, they do that on the platform because the financial institutions are part of that same platform. They literally automatically get the financing. So instead of having to wait 120 days for this $10,000, he gets it instantly. He won't get the full 10000 of course. You know, there'll be, a, there'll be a little snippet for the banks in it because everybody needs to benefit from it. But what a change that is, right? And even if they don't opt for the financing, they have perfect visibility of when they get paid. And that visibility is sometimes even more important because the treasury, both on the supplier side and on the buying side, need to know when cash goes in and out. You know, you don't want to, another organization, um, Sears does the same thing, Sears Canada. You know, they used to hold a kitty of more than five million just to be able to deal with the variability of not actually knowing exactly when they're supposed to pay their suppliers. You know, if you can just reduce that, get rid of that, you know, just the cost of capital of holding five million and you can do something else with that, that's by itself is a business case already. Um, is there anybody else I want to pick on? Uh, Syngenta, just one more manufacturing example. Syngenta is, a, is a, uh, an organization that uh, makes seeds or sells seeds and crop protection products. Um, if you like spinach, you have a 95% chance that you're eating Syngenta spinach because they pretty much own the, the, the spinach market. Little fact there for you. Um, what did they want to do? They wanted to control their logistics process better. So they decided that they wanted to set up a 4PL uh, process, a 4PL control tower. So they still are using uh, XBO, DHL, and Damco to, to manage the physical movement on the goods, both you know, mostly on trucks, but some of it in ocean and different modes of transport. But they didn't want to let go of the information because they clearly knew that information was the absolute key to managing their processes. So again, what do you do? Well, you join a platform, you join a network and have all these other people join that network and be able to then execute all the processes yet still have full control over everything that's going on. Uh, Mary Methuen stated herself that that has managed to save them more than 80 million over an 18 months period. Okay, kind of keeping an eye on the clock here. Um, my clock has stopped, so that's probably a bad sign. Let's talk a little bit about innovation. So some of the stuff that is kind of happening or is about to happen, and I'm gonna show you a couple of bits here that are, that are pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, innovative or pretty new, I should say. A uh, couple of bits that I'm gonna to touch upon. Uh, IoT, and IoT to most people still is, um, uh, Machine maintenance, right? Have an IoT device and figuring out when, uh, when, when maintenance should be taking place. You know, I just used the example before of the drill head and having, having IoT devices on there. Uh, without a doubt, fantastic stuff. But that's not what I'm personally interested in. I'm personally interested in what you can do with that from a transportation perspective, from a logistics perspective. Now, of course, the logical thing is that you can stick it on a, on a truck or you can stick it on a container or you can stick it on a product inside a container and you can start measuring where the stuff is and then you can have a pretty picture like this. And you can have your whole team looking at this and deciding, you know, uh, I know exactly where my stuff is. That's of course not why we do this, right? It's nice, but it's, that's not why we do it. Uh, one of the use cases that we're working on here is with an electronics company. So they've got a very particular thing that they want to do. They don't want to um, they want to take ownership of the inventory until they really, really, really have to, the last minute, and then they'll show it on their books, right? It's good, the financial guys like that. So when do they take ownership? When the product is in national waters in the US. So they need to know, pinpoint exactly, they want to know when the goods are actually going from international waters to national waters. <coughs> right, 
And you could say, arguably, well, once the vessel has arrived, then you know you kind of knew that a little bit beforehand that it went into national waters. It's like, well, no, you need to kind of know accurately. But I also don't want to say, well, I'm going to do it now, 10 days before, the, before a vessel arrived, because that means that you're going to have a vast amount of days of inventory additionally sitting on your books. So for them, there is a huge business case to be able to pinpoint that point exactly. How do you do that? You simply geofence the borders, and you know exactly when the vessel goes through that, and you say, ping, okay, here's the message. Oh, and by the way, because it's a networked approach, you know exactly what's on that vessel. You know what containers are on there, you know what's in those containers, what boxes are in there, and you know what's in those boxes, so you know exactly what SKUs you're talking about. Um, other things that you can, uh, can think of and, and, and we're, uh, we're, we're working on is using that same capabilities to start overlaying you know, political or, or incidents that happen and being able to identify very quickly, even quicker than the likes of an Electrolux have been able to do, exactly what's impacted. Right? And from a, from a vessel perspective, that might be relatively straightforward. But if you start thinking about trucking and things like that, being able to pinpoint immediately if there is a strike, you know, what's, the, what's the effect of that strike? Or you know, if there's some sort of major disaster, being able to pinpoint exactly what orders are affected, what inventory is affected by that. That's kind of the, another use case of where this can go. And I'm sure you could come up with many other use cases as well. Let me talk a little bit about um, predictive ETAs and machine learning. Today, most people find out where their stuff is because somebody tells them, you know, trust me, it'll be there on X, Y, Z, you know. In two weeks' times, it'll be there. And we might get that information electronically, uh, but that still is a, trust me, it'll, it'll be there. Um, and often, you know, it doesn't always work out that way, right? Sometimes, uh, sometimes the, uh, the, the, the carriers are, are not providing all, exactly all the information that they, you would like to have to manage your supply chain. Um, so is there another way of doing it? Well, there is if you're sitting on 17 years worth of transport information and you figured out that there is some clever algorithms that can look at all of that data and can start predicting based on all sorts of additional impacts when a shipment is going to arrive. So we call that machine learning, machine intelligence. It's a, it's a, clever, it's a clever way of figuring out based on historical information and the current situation when something is going to arrive. And overlay that on the ETAs that you, uh, that you get from carriers or that you have predicted yourself based on kind of fixed lead times that you have in your planning tools or, or other places. A huge, huge improvement <coughs> on, on ETA accuracy there. Um, but machine learning, of course, gets applied into many different areas as well, and I'll, I'll touch upon just, uh, just one. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with Walgreens, and this is really on the demand forecasting side. So there we've, uh, we're helping them to come up with a with the demand forecast that doesn't just look at you know, the typical historical information and what have you, but also looks at the, the flu epidemics, the, the weather forecast, and pulls all these things in to, and clearly product by product, uh, and be, is able then to be able to predict exactly what product they need, where, where in the US they need this, et cetera, et cetera. So their accuracy has gone up dramatically just being able to do this more in a more, um, in a more uh, intelligent way, if you, if you like. And there's many other examples like that, but I, uh, I, won't, uh, I won't go into details on that. One thing that is uh, a personal favorite of me and, and has a bit of a resurrection to, to some degree is, uh, is the concept of control towers. Now, control towers, the concept has been around forever and a day, and when, uh, when we say control tower, most people are envisioning something like this, right? Ideally, even with a, with a glass cage around it, right? And then we can look inside of it. I've been to many companies that have actually have those, right? And it looks mega impressive. Huge screens, you know, glass, you know, eye, eye scanners to get into the thing. You know, it's amazing. Not sure why you have glass and then an eye scanner, because you can see through the glass. But anyway, um, it, it looks cool, right? But in nine out of 10 times, that's not really a control tower, right? It, 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 it's simply just a monitoring device, right? And I was going to, um, I was going to clo clo play you a little, uh, little clip here, but uh, unfortunately, the, the digital transformation of 
uh, Hilton Internet uh, being able to work is, uh, is an illustrious, uh, illustrious uh, activity. So we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll have to do with me just telling you the joke. You can, you can look, it, uh, look it up. But uh, this is a little ad, and it talks about, you know, the, the ridicules the concept of monitoring something but not doing something about it. Right? If you're a dentist, he says, well, I'm not actually a dentist. You know, if you've got a cavity, but I'm not a dentist. I'm a dentist monitor. He's like, goodbye, and he just walks off. Right? Can you imagine us as supply chain practitioners saying that to our boss? It's like, whoo, you know, vessel's just gone on fire. See ya. You, know, you can't do that, right? We, 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 are, we are held responsible for being able to fix the problem as well. So kind of the catchphrase at the end of that clip is, you know, why monitor a problem if you can't fix it? And I, I kind of agree with that, right? So to me, a control tower isn't about pretty pictures and being able to say on the, on the walls, like, you know, just wait. In two hours' time, that's going to update again, and then you'll, you know, you'll see slightly different colors. And, you know, what do you do with it? Well, I don't know. Don't really do anything with it, right? That's not a control tower, at least not the way that, that we view it. A control tower should be underpinned with a, with a resolution workflow. Right? What is that? Well, first step, <laughs> clearly you need visibility. So again, you need a network, right? You need the network visibility of everything that's happening within your supply chain. Within your four walls as well, of course, but also that 80% that's outside of your four walls. You need to be able to see all of that. You need to have a mechanism to be able to create exceptions. You know, my, uh, I've just been told by my supplier an exception popped up because the supplier has just updated the, the ship date of its products by a week. And he says he's going to ship a week late. Now, that's an exception. Um, that moment in time, I don't know if we should get excited or scared about that or anything. You know, we don't know yet, right? We, we don't know what the impact of that is yet. So the next stage is like, okay, I take exceptions and I see what is the business impact of that, right? That exception of shipping a week later might have no implication at all because actually I've got a stack of inventory sitting in my DC of that particular product and I don't really care if it's a week late. <coughs> actually, it's quite beneficial because, you know, I can reduce some of my stock. Or it might be the other way around. That particular, particular order is actually being used to fulfill a very large shipment to a customer. I'm going to lose out on $20,000 or pounds if I don't get this stuff on time. Major issue. So an alert, that same alert could be a huge business issue or no issue at all. So it's important to be able to put that in the context, the context of cost and revenue. And then, of course, you need to uh, figure out how you're going to resolve it. Right? How are we going to resolve that? Because nine out of ten times, you're going to have a constrained situation now, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, if it's easy to solve, then, of course, it gets solved easily. Most of the times, you'll, you'll have, to, uh, you have to figure out, what am I going to do? Am I going to make customer A happy or customer B happy? Or am I going to, you know, uh, uh, do something on the, on the supply side? What you certainly need is a couple of tools and a couple of capabilities at your disposal to be able to do that resolution stuff. Um, First and foremost, you need to be able to collaborate, right? The example that the three of us here had before, you know, we need to be able to communicate. We need to be able to say, hey, Mr. Supplier, I know you told me that there's going to be a week late, those 100 units, but, you know, what's the real situation here? Can you at least get 50 of them out? Because those 50 are used for a sales order. The other 50 are just for stock replacement. I don't really care about that. And maybe the answer is like, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Boom, problem solved. I might not have the perfectly consolidated shipment anymore, and I'm going to spend a little bit more money on that transport of that, but that's okay, right? The alternative might be like, well, you know, I can get it, but, you know, uh, uh, only, only five days later. All right, well, stick it on a plane. You're my 3PL, you're my air forwarder. When you pick it up, don't put it on a vessel, put it on a plane and, and ship it over, and I'll deal with the cost. But not all 100, just the 50 that I need. Right? All that stuff, only, you can only do that by collaborating, right? You need to collaborate and figure out what the, what, the, what the situation truly is. And guess how do you collaborate, right? By having all people working on the same mechanism, on the same platform, on the same network. We'll be wanting to do some scenario analysis as well, and I'll, and I'll touch upon that a little bit later again. And then finally, once you've... Once you start building up history around all of this, you start building history around how you solve problems, guess what you can do again? 
right? Same as before with this predictive ETA. You can start making recommendations by putting some clever algorithm on top and say, hey, in 80% of the time when this particular issue occurs, 80% of the time the solution was this one, that one, or that one. So we can actually interject, okay, we're using machine learning, we can interject recommendations immediately at the beginning of the process and say, you know, look at this first. Um, what does that stuff look like? Well, maybe it looks like something like this. And these are some mock-up screenshots here of what the front end of, of our new control, control center uh, uh, looks like. I see here an ability to look at all the high-level KPIs by region and by product line. Now, I'm interested in that particular one because I'm responsible for that. So I'm looking at that. And now my product and, and region is depicted at the top. And guess what? I can see a beautiful graph, but it's actually an intelligent graph. So I can see based on the colors, if something is running on time, if it's not on time. I can also see all that information in a, in a tabular format. And I can see lots of other, other uh, 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 widgets that I can utilize to be able to provide more information to me as, an, as, the, as the user of this particular, particular uh, uh, capability. And this might still be on a big monitor, right? But it is all interrelated to the underlying applications which the actual users, the guys who are doing the work for us, or, and that might be you or your colleagues, they're actually doing stuff all the time on the network. They're not looking at this. They are actually looking at their task list. I've got issues. I need to solve those issues. I need to collaborate on them. But at the highest level, you do want to have the ability to pull all of that together. And that's exactly what this is. You know? And me, being the, being the general manager of this particular business unit, I want to see the related issues that are in my, in my particular, uh, in my particular uh, uh, area. And I can see here there's some, I can't actually see it, so if you can see it, you know, I'd be very impressed. But um, I can see here there's an issue, and I can click on that and see, oh, there's, this is a late inbound shipment, and it's got 200,000 of revenue at risk. Okay, that's a problem, right? Let me just figure out what else I can see. Okay, these are the suppliers and the parties associated with it. But, hey, wait a minute. I can see actions have already been taken. There's been a transfer order. Andy, my DC manager on, in the east side, and Carmen, the DC, guy, uh, DC lady on the west side, have already been collaborating with each other on this issue whilst I was asleep, right? I came in in the morning and looked at this thing. I saw that issue. The reality is it's already been solved. How can you do that? Well, they're all operating on the same platform. They're all operating on a network. And they already got that issue at their level. It's like, hey, you need to fix this. All right. First thing he did was collaborate with, her, with Carmen. And Carmen has some spare inventory. So they, Carmen created a transfer order of those goods, shipped them over to Andy's DC, and the problem is solved. Great. So you know, click. I just want to be able to now say, quickly say to them, thank you, Andy. Thank you, um, thank you, Carmen. You know, great job. You know, it's uh, seven o'clock in the morning, and goodness, you guys have already solved the problem before I even got up. I love it. And you might think, like, okay, what's what are all these other things doing? Well, there's lots and lots of information you could pull up. The idea is to have historical information, now information, stuff that is happening right now, and future impact information, all at your disposal, as well as all the issues, because me at, at where I am in my organization, that is the way that I communicate to the rest of the organization. Everything else is for me to monitor and keep tab of what's going on. But again, just to drill, that home, drill this point home, if I call that a control center, you do need to have all the underlying capabilities to be able to not just feed that, but also to action the things that either have been triggered by here uh, or, um, or um, uh, have been triggered by here or by, uh, that it needs to be, be sorted out. And that might even include mobile as well. I've been told that I need to hurry up, so I will certainly do so. Um, I'll be two seconds. I talked a little bit about scenario analysis, and that's a whole topic by itself, and I'm not going to do it fully justice uh, right now. But scenario analysis you know, sometimes the stuff is really complicated, right? It's not as simple as us just collaborating or just saying like, hey, what's the, what's the impact? Sometimes in larger organizations, for sure, you need to be able to do some, so run some systems to be able to figure out like, what's the impact? You know, what's the least pain that I'm going to incur on my sales side? Or what's the least cost? You need to run systems for that. And scenario planning 
with that real-time information is exactly the way that we're doing that. So we're utilizing the network, the execution capabilities, and in including that with planning to be able to run those planning cycles so that we can actually do the really the, the more complicated stuff, we can actually create recommendations that way as well. Last thing I want to say is a um, little bit of advertisement. We're, uh, we're running a little uh, um, round table with the topic of mastering supply chain risk in a network supply chain. You probably are, uh, already understand what the, the topics are more or less are going to be about. I've got, we've got some heavy competition from some great speakers and other, uh, and other round tables, but if you're interested in this topic, please do join us. And with that, I thank you very much for allowing me to share some of the things that excite me greatly. So thank you and have a great, uh, a great event. Thank you.